This is Thursday, September 18, 2014. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Sam Bernstein. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? April the 11th, 1924. And where were you born? In New London, Connecticut. What is your current address? What town do you live in? Randolph, Massachusetts. Your marital status? Oh, yes. 66 years. What's your wife's name? Roberta. Do you have children? Three children. Grandchildren? Seven grandchildren. Great-grandchildren? And three great-granddaughters. All right, Sam, tell us what New London was like growing up. What it was like? Yeah. Your childhood, your parents? I was, I was born and gone through the Depression years. Very, very difficult and different than from today. Attitudes were established that follow you into the 70s and 80s that don't exist in today's generations. It was tough. And with World War II, we were caught in a situation that I never went to higher education because of that. I had to go through the draft into the Marines. What did your father do for a living? My father was a tailor. I like to mention Taylor. He made Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, uniforms when Douglas MacArthur came out of West Point in 1903, I believe. And matter of fact, he was in contact with the general immediately after the war when he went to Congress to talk to the legislature. And do you have any brothers or sisters? Four brothers, making five sons, no sisters, all in the service in World War II. I was the youngest. It was at that point stated by the President of the United States that the Bernstein boys would not be allowed to serve in any capacity together because of what happened to the Sullivan brothers prior to that time. That left me, the youngest one, still in high school. The Marines was the only thing available to me. <laughs> Why were the Marines the only option for you? Well, the president said that uh, all the Bernstein boys would have to go in in different branches of service. So my oldest brother, who went in first, he was from the ROTC. He was in the engineers, Army engineers. My next brother down the line went into the Coast Guard in Norfolk, Virginia. My next brother became pilot for the ATC, that's the Air Transport Command, eventually becoming part of the Army Air Force. And he flew the bombers into North Africa. And the next brother down was Ralph. Uh, he was in the tank battalion. So when the draft took me, I was able to demand the Marines, volunteering. Now, where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military on January the 14th, 1944. Sorry, correction, 1943. In Springfield, Massachusetts. Now, only by a fate, 
I was discharged three years to the date, to the hour, January 14th, just before lunch, usually is when you're inducted and discharged, 1946 in California. Now, Sam, before you were drafted, you said you were in high school. What was high school like during the war years? Well, during the war years, we were very excited. We're, usually, uh, most of us were 17 and 18. I was 18. And we were allowed, after the draft caught us, to finish high school. We were allowed to finish high school and then stand by for induction right immediately after. And everybody, every male was anxious to serve, there was no doubt. Do you remember wartime restrictions such as rationing? Wartime what? Wartime restrictions such as like rationing of gas, sugar, do you remember that? I'm sorry, I don't follow. Okay. Um, when you were in high school, yes. this was during the war. Yes. Do you remember um, rationing, gas rationing, sugar rationing? Oh, absolutely, rationing. There's no more of this, no more of that, no sugar, no this. Everything you had to have cards. You had to have little cards to for the for the sugar. For, of course, uh, we didn't mind it. All my brothers were already uh, uh, serving, not me, serving in 43 when I went in. They've already entered. So that left my mother and father and myself at home and uh, managed very, very well. Do you remember scrap drives? What's that? Uh, drives for scrap metal? Scrap metal? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Uh, I, used to, I used to go around in the gutters of the street picking up cigarette uh, uh, wrappings from the cigarettes. In those days, everybody smoked. I didn't. But I picked up the silver the, and wrap it and then turn it in. And any kind of uh, tin and metal was accumulated and, and turned in. Now, Sam, before you were drafted, and did you I have, wasn't drafted. Oh, sorry. I volunteered. You volunteered. From the draft. From the draft. Okay. Uh, did you uh, do any kind of work, a part-time job? Yes. And what did you do? I graduated in June of 43. Correction. Correction. Mm -hmm. I graduated in June of 42. And immediately after graduation, they did not call me. I got a job at the Electric Boat Company in Groton, Connecticut, which is just opposite, uh, across the river, the Thames River from New London, uh, as a helper. I was only seven, 18 years old, uh, a, a helper carrying stuff from the warehouse into the submarines for the men to install. And I held that job until uh, the draft called me, which was January 14th, 1943. In Springfield, Massachusetts, Springfield is where I was inducted. All right, tell us what happened. In Springfield? Yes. You don't want to know. Anti-Semitism. Oh dear. You want it? No. You want it? Sure. I was called in Springfield to the Marine Corps Station. If you don't want it, you can cross this out. 
as they inspected every boy that came through, ready to send us to Paris Island, South Carolina. They make your dog tags out. And the dog tags are stamped, you know, metal tags around your neck. When it came time for me, they asked me what religion they want paste that, that stamped on, C or P. I said, I'm Jewish. I want a J or an H. We don't do that H's and J's, just C or P. I was 18 years old, and that's why they call me the SOB Marine. I refused to swear myself in. I refused to raise my right hand to be sworn in. And at that point, an officer took over in charge to find out what is wrong. And I explained to him, I am not going to have a COP, which means Catholic or Protestant. It's not my religion. And I was warned about that because the law says if they're burying you, a boy in the cemetery, his dog tag is one stays with the body and one is sent usually to some clerical place for notification. If it's a COP, you're buried under a cross. Otherwise, if it's a C H or a J, you'd get a Jewish star. And I got the H. Absolutely. You raise your right hand, you'll be a, in the Marines with an H on your dog tag. And that was the first incident of anti-Semitism with me in the service. But that's 1943, when the whole United States, the whole world was in a different attitude. Remember, in 1943, when I was inducted, I had never, unfortunately, read newspapers. I'm in high school. And because I didn't read newspapers, like you do today, I didn't hear about anything what's going on in Europe or to understand it. That's why it was very confusing to me. Mm -hmm. All right, you've sworn in. Pardon what, me? You're, you're now sworn in to the Marines. Yes. Tell us what happened next. Basic training at Paris Island. Oh, now we went all the way by train to Paris Island, South Carolina. Buford, South Carolina. And like I wrote my mother, I remember it so vivid, the first letter. Uh, I, was, uh, I was adamant when it came to music in my time, uh, the big bands. And I wrote my mother, yes, I found where it is June and January. The song is right. Cause Paris Island was June in January while my mother and father were freezing up in, in New London, Connecticut in winter. Now, Sam, was this the first time you were away from home? Very first time. And you got to meet other recruits from oh, yes. other parts of the we country. We went in a whole group. Mm -hmm. And I have the papers uh, that authorize uh, from Springfield my induction paper with all the people who went on that train with me. Tell us more about basic training. Basic training, I say, and I look back, was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Why? It was tough, rough, unbelievable. The first thing they did to me is took away any medication I had. You don't need it down here. In other words, either you make it or we'll break you. That's the attitude. And I was on medication. Uh, I think the reason was I had an ulcer. What they call it, the Wadner ulcer. And uh, no, you're gonna make it or we'll break you. And believe me, I, I'm surprised I made it because it was very, very tough. But an honest 
way. Nothing of this business of getting a man killed. They took good care of us, fed us right, and trained us good. And it paid off on Iwo Jima. Well, of course, be talking about Iwo Jima later, but let's get you there first. Sure. What happened after BASIC? After BASIC, uh, that was eight weeks of BASIC, and I was sent to New River, North Carolina. New River, North Carolina, Camp Lejeune. And there, uh, we gave an op was given an opportunity if we wanted to go to school uh, for classes to, uh, for a specialty. And oh, I'm excited because if you pass the test and get out and, uh, from uh, class there, usually a three month class, you get the first stripe, PFC, private first class. Oh, that ain't. That was exciting to be a, already with a one stripe. So I volunteered for the, uh, the engineers. I figured something in the engineers. Lo and behold, I was entered into a class with 12 other men to learn everything and to teach others camouflage. I don't know what camouflage means at that time. I had to go to the library to look it up. Camouflage, the deceiving of the body, uh, like the Japanese did on the islands, by painting your faces with cold cream and, and different colors and, and taking jewelry off and don't wear a watch. And all these items to protect the Marines in the, on the islands. A matter of fact, I became an instructor, then I became a Hollywood Marine. In other words, the 12 of us were sent to California to Camp Pendleton. And Camp Pendleton is where the Marine divisions are prepared for shipment overseas and combat. And the first thing they did was assign me with the other boys to uh, the 5th Marine Division was just being organized because the other divisions were badly broken up from the battles. They needed a fresh division and we had the division I taught everybody in the division, 150 men usually every morning in the woods, how to paint their faces. Now, paint your faces. During the course of instruction, they sent me to 20th Century Fox Studio in Hollywood. Veronica Lake, if you ever heard of her, Veronica Lake and a few other girls, I forget their names, hers I remember, because I saw them in the movies, taught us how to paint your face with cold cream. Now, cold cream. They would give us about a million tubes the size of a, uh, a big uh, uh, marker. You know what a, a big marker looks like, a big thumb? the markers, you know. Mm -hmm. They give those about a million to be distributed amongst the Marines. We would distribute them in three colors, uh, uh, a beige, a, a brown, and a green, and, and, and a little reddish, burnt red. And Veronica Lake and, the, and all the girls taught us how to take them and streak your face and take the your watch off and take your rings off. She was one of the instructors there two weeks at 20th Century Fox Studio, the Hollywood Marine. But lo and behold, uh, going fast, the President of the United States at that time, he, he's doing something else. He's building an atomic bomb. And Iwo Jima 
comes in after that. So what was Veronica Lake like? <laughs> Veronica Lake, uh, and I have to recall everything. I can remember it was just like in heaven. Two weeks on Fox Studio lot in, in Western Los Angeles. And uh, she was an instructor. Uh, matter of fact, the three companies, I think three or four, the, they ordered uh, stuff was, came from uh, Col uh, Colby, uh, Max Factor, and Elizabeth Arden uh, manufactured the cold cream. Uh, and like I say, it's, uh, each tube was like a green tube and, and, a, uh, and a beige tube and a brown one. And I gave every Marine, when we get back to camp, almost 18,000. 18,000. Because every man going into overseas got equipment. And that was part of it, the camouflage, so that the men would sort of, we sort of break up the, the form of uh, your face and your hands. From a distance, it maybe, maybe, hopefully, would blend in with the terrain, like the Japanese were doing. That's what the idea was. Of course, on Iwo Jima, they might just as well never had me, but they did, because there wasn't a blade of grass on eight square miles. You know what chlorophyll is. No chlorophyll on the island. No water on the island. No drinking water. <laughs> no infrastructure. No infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's get you back to Hollywood for a moment before we get you yes. overseas. Tell us, I mean, you were an instructor. In Camp these, Pendleton. In Camp Pendleton, teaching these Marines how to... Every morning... Every morning, a company, a company of men is about 200 men, basically, uh, would have to go through what they call indoctrination. Uh, there would be uh, camouflage schools, uh, there would be engineering schools, there would be hand grenade schools, all kinds of classes, one-day classes, in the woods, in the woods of Camp Pendleton. You, they marched the men into the woods, and we had uh, wooden benches we made it for them. And w in my place, I'm just talking about my, what I did, uh, they'd come in about 7.30 in the morning, and the first thing I was told to tell them, that's why I was called the Hollywood Marine, the SOB, because I was taught to take charge of 200 men and tell them, instruct them, take off your insignias. Rank will not be recognized in this class. Here I am, 19 years old, telling colonels and generals to take your insignias off. It was to teach them that they cannot wear them in battle, because they'll be the first ones who will be shot. Also, we were worried about snipers from a distance they could spot these insignias. Also, I had to lecture and say something, and I have, a, have the nerve and guts to say it to these older men and high-ranking men without the fear of uh, retaliation from them. Mm -hmm. And we did. We taught them how to paint their faces, how to take off the jewelry from their uh, hands, how to make sure their dog tags are covered in, in a black tape, because from a distance that could reflect the light. And we found a lot of boys were being shot in, in the fingers. But well, what the heck? Why is the Japs so good they can shoot your fingers? It's because the rings would reflect, and a spark would from the sun, and the Jap in the tree could spot that. So these are the things we taught them. And then we taught them to uh, fix their helmets with uh, uh, foliage stuck in there, nets on there. And we provided the, 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 the cold cream in colors, and we provided the nets for the helmets. And these are the things we did in a 
I'd say from 7.30 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And then they go tomorrow to another class in the woods about dynamite, how to treat dynamite and things like that. And they, everybody had to go through the classes so that the division was fully trained. We were trained. And you did this for how long again? Oh, uh, that's, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember how long. Uh, I would say uh, about seven or eight months. And then on to Hilo, Hawaii. Hilo, on the big island, not Honolulu. And he... All right, and, that, and was this the first time you were on board a ship? First time in my life. And how was the journey? Got sick. It was exciting. Remember, I have to ask you to go and put your mind on an 18 year old, 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 year olds, kids who never left home, who never knew what the word war was, who never knew what the Holocaust, never heard the word Holocaust, who don't know nothing except kill Japs because what they did at Pearl Harbor. And the Marines, everything is Japs, Japs, because the Marines were not in Europe. They were only in the South Pacific, in the Pacific. So uh, it was exciting more than fear. How long did it take you to go from Camp Pendleton to Hilo, Hawaii? Oh, my God. That there took about a uh, little over a week. Of course, they don't go straight. Mm -hmm. They go zigzag to avoid uh, submarines. That about a week to get to Hilo. And what did you do once you got on Hilo? Hilo? Mm -hmm. Hilo, we had what they called the final training of combat. We lived in tents, no, no buildings. We lived way out in the woods. As a matter of fact, the tent we... The camp that I was in was called Camp POW, P-O-W, which stands for Prisoner of War. The Japanese who were in Hilo, on the, uh, the island, as soon as war was declared and Roosevelt declared, he had all Japanese interned in this camp, Camp POW. And they were taken out, I don't know where they went, and this camp we took over the uh, outfit, my fifth division uh, in Hilo. Now there are two parts to Hilo. The, my division, my companies, three companies, stayed on the the town of Hilo. The 18,000 men of the fifth marine division went about 70 miles up the mountain, Mount Kilauea, up in the hill. Uh, the reason we stayed on the town is on the water, on the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, the Pacific Ocean, and we were the ones who unloaded the ships when they came into Hilo. We were fancy stevedores. No camouflage then. Everything was working in empty ships, my outfit. Now, what... Um Let's see, you were, you entered the service back in January two, uh, 1943, is that correct? Yes. And what time of the year was it when you were in Hilo? Well, I landed in, uh, in, in, the, in New River, right in February, just the 1st of April mm -hmm. in, in New River, and then New River, Three months, May, June, I'd say July 1st, mm -hmm. went to California. And there, that's in 43. Mm -hmm. And then we shipped out of, of California about 
April of 44. Okay, so you're now in Hawaii. It's the spring of 1944. Yeah. And you're basically being what you called fancy stevedores. Probably. Um, unloading the ships? Yeah. Okay. Were you aware of anything else happening in the Pacific theater or in the European theater? Oh, God, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, while we just about leaving California, the th uh, second Marine Division, at that time there was only four divisions. Mine was created with fifth division, we made five, but there were only four and they were all battle stricken already. Uh, the second division had just taken and destroyed an island called Tawara. That was about June of 44. And we landed in Hilo. At the same time, what was going on in Europe, I knew nothing. At my age, and I never, never, none of us saw a newspaper <laughs> in, in the service. So how long were you on Hilo? On Hilo? Yes. In, in Hilo? In Hilo. Uh, I'd say, uh, let's see, uh, in Hilo from, from about April 44 to New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve 45, we bought a ship in the middle of the night. New Year's Eve 45. Okay. We don't know where we're going. They said Iwo Jima, that might just as well New York City or Boston, Massachusetts, which I heard of, never heard of Iwo Jima. For three days, they didn't tell us what, where, only that name is Iwo Jima. Then they broke out, just like you have in the, in the room here, uh, a, a, a map and a layout of Iwo Jima to show us exactly what we're going to do. While you were learning about Iwo Jima, did they tell you about what was happening on Guam or the rest of the Marianas? Oh, not uh, too much. Just that uh, the 3rd Division has liberated Guam. The second division took Tarawa. The first division, the first ones to take Guadalcanal, the first island that the Americans took away from the Japanese on the way to Tokyo. And oh yes, they, uh, we got the scuttlebutt of, of what's going on in our outfits, mm -hmm. the Marines. Do you remember what was the best way you got the news? Did you get it like Scuttlebutt or through the radio, newspapers? No newspaper, no radios, <laughs> all through word of mouth. Scuttlebutt. All right, so now what was your division ordered to do once you approached Iwo Jima? What, what you're ordered to do? Yes. We were ordered aboard ship. We're all 18, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds. I would say that out of the 18,000, there was leftover from other divisions, uh, sergeants and officers in the 30s. But basically, early 20s was the average age. And we were told, not like today, all you boys are going to go to shore and to Iwo Jima. A lot of you boys will not come home. 
the chaplain even told us, a lot of you boys will be wounded mortally. Kill everybody in front of you and let's go home and live like human beings. Sam, at the time of Iwo Jima, what was your rank? My rank? Your rank. Private first class. And were you uh, worth any specific company? Yes. Mm -hmm. A company, Fifth Pioneers. Now, pioneers is what the word implies, pioneers. It consists of everything imaginable. A little, they had a couple of bulldozers, uh, men who knew how to handle dynamite, that's the school that they, we had, uh, those classes we had, and men who were camouflage, and men who, who knew, knew every different things, so that whatever the division required, they take it, the pioneers, there's always somebody who could fill in those jobs. The main thing that the pioneers do, the main job is stevedores, unloading ships. So when the ships with all the supplies would come into Hilo, they all came into Hilo for preparation for the battle, we'd unload the ships in Hilo and they would put them into different areas of Hilo, uh, the supplies, the ammunition, the food, the water and everything that was going to be required for Iwo Jima. We did not realize what Iwo Jima was until after we landed. Your division landed when on Iwo Jima? Was when, it in February? February 19th at 9 o'clock in the morning, 1943. If, excuse me, 1945. Mm -hmm. February 19th, the first Americans to invade homeland Japan landed on Iwo Jima at 9 o'clock in waves of five minutes apart, waves. Uh, you people uh, ever remember the Charge of the Light Brigade, the picture? In, in the Charge of the Light Brigade, they came in uh, down the, the, uh, the uh, battles to the right of us and battles to the left of us and battles in front of you, and they came down in waves in the charge of the Light Brigade. Well, Iwo Jima was the first time they did in waves of five minutes apart. A wave, each boat, a Higgins boat, just like the boat outside in the back here, there's a Higgins boat, that's what we went into Iwo. About 20 men fit it in the boat, depending on the size of the boat. And I'd say about 400 men 500 men went in on a wave. I landed on the sixth wave. The sixth wave, now about 9.30, the first wave landed at 9 o'clock. I hit the beach at about 9.30. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier about the terrain on Iwo Jima, which in Japanese means sulfur well, island. Well, you don't, you don't understand. Nobody, nobody understands. There is no terrain. Mm -hmm. Iwo Jima, if I have to describe it, when God created the earth and created the world, he had to have a place to put all the waste, and that's where he dumped it. Basically, they say in history books that Iwo Jima is the top of a mountain that sank in the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, thousands and thousands of years ago. And that must be the top of it. Must, we're not positive. Iwo Jima was almost not more than five or six feet above sea level, so that the sea came up most of it. Then as it increased itself, you have Mount Suribachi, which was 550 feet high. 
When I landed, I can't believe it. Uh, how do I describe it? I'm telling you, no chlorophyll. If there's no chlorophyll, there's no vegetation. If there's no vegetation, there's no trees. No trees, no infrastructure whatsoever. No grass whatsoever. It's all volcanic ash. And now volcanic ash is like sand in black, it's black, but it, it's like ball barrens. You cannot stand on it. It just slides. You can't walk. You can't dig a hole, because as soon as you dig it, the side falls in. But it's like sand, only it's so fine, uh, sulfur, and so hard that uh, you can't dig it, except other, uh, some parts of the island did have a harder dirt. Matter of fact, that's when they made the cemetery that they had to find a place there that had not what we call dirt, but uh, stronger earth than just the volcanic ash. All right, Larry, you're on Iwo Jima. Tell us what happened next. Oh, the first day? Yes. Well, the Japanese were known to, uh, to meet us, us meaning uh, Marines, on the beach when there's an invasion, when they uh, attack. They meet us and we, and we fight mostly with machine guns and hand grenades and hand to hand, which is different than the war today. You've got a man in front of you. But this General Kurobachi, who was American raised in college. Imagine the general who, who was the commanding general on Iwo Jima for the Japanese, went to college in America. And we trained him. He tried a new thing. He knew that Iwo Jima will have to be taken for an order of the Americans to go to Japan. You, without Iwo Jima, it's a too long a story, the atomic bomb could never get to Japan. You must neutralize Iwo Jima, because Iwo Jima is 750 miles from Tokyo. The bombers that go to Tokyo every day in those days to bomb Tokyo and Japan are in Tinian, on Tinian. That is next to Saipan, which is more familiar, Tinian. And Tinian is 1,500 miles from Japan. Well, the bombers cannot go to Japan and bomb it and get back. God forbid they're hit. They will not get back because they'll run out of fuel. Their distance is only 3,000 miles, and that's it. Up and back is 3,000 miles. So the president knew that Iwo Jima has to be neutralized so that the atomic bomb, we didn't know all this until after, could fly over Iwo Jima, which was in the middle of the distance, and get there. So to take Iwo Jima, we must kill, kill everybody on that island, leave nothing that can stop the pl our planes from taking off without being attacked. And that's the idea. We need those airfields. Now, Iwo Jima is only four miles long. Four miles from here to Wellesley is four miles. Four miles long, and at the narrow point, you can run it in a half an hour. Less than a half a mile at the narrow point. We landed February 19th at 9 o'clock. I got in at 9.30. We came out on the beach, and like I tell you, Kurobachi, he always, Jap Japanese, meet us on the beach to fight. There was not one Japanese on the island, as far as we knew. They told us aboard ship, don't worry, this is a, a piece of cake going to Iwo Jima. There's nobody alive there, because the airplanes that flew over for, for identification and everything, couldn't see any movement, nothing. 
Well, the reason they couldn't see anything, there are 22,000 Japanese there. They're underground. Not only are they underground, there's hospitals underground. There's a two-gauge railroad. That means a small, a narrow rail, a, a gauge railroad that could take stuff from one end of the island to the other end, underground, 70 feet. Everything on Iwo Jima, Japanese, was underground. So no Japs came to meet us on the beach. His idea was he's going to kill as many Marines and make this so costly to occupy Iwo Jima that maybe the President of the United States will think twice about coming to Japan. Well, he made a mistake. We came in, I got in the foxhole, the best I could dig it, and about 10.30, I gave it in 9.30, 10.30, from Suribachi, which is 550 feet at the end of the island, right near us, we, we ended, we came in near Suribachi to, to the other end of the island, the Japanese had their mortars and cannons facing the beach. Now, we had 800 ships out on the water, but they couldn't destroy those Japanese because the openings to those cannons were facing parallel to the beach, and our ships are at 90 degrees to them. So at about 10.30, they opened a barrage from Mount Suobachi, the likes of which you can't imagine. There was no place on that beach that you won't get hit. By the grace of God, I'm here. Uh, because you would only interview anybody who was alive. So that's it. I'm unusual to have survived. Everybody seemed to have been killed there on the beach. And that was his theory, to kill as many Marines, and they will stop and won't go to Japan, because it'll be worse. He was wrong, because I came in on the sixth wave because they moved the first five waves who took the brunt of the first landing. All the pillboxes on, that were built on the beach attacked our first wave. Then the first wave went over them and went in a half a mile, and so we came in. Now the pioneers, my outfit, like I said, the main job is unloading ships. I was a machine gunner to protect the beach, meaning that I set up my machine gun where they showed me, and I cannot move. I have to stay there with the gun and stop any Japanese coming down to the beach, which would be unloading supplies. I, we landed at 9.30, and nobody, nobody moved on the beach. We just prayed to God and kept our heads down until one o'clock in the afternoon as the barrage came down on top of us. The only thing that stopped the barrage, because the ships couldn't do it, because the guns were faced parallel to the beach. But we finally got what's called the, the 13th Marines. The 13th Marines are artillery. Uh, um, uh, what do you call it, 75 and 105 uh, millimeter uh, cannons. And we finally got, came in, the 13th Marines on the beach, and when they came in, they set up their mortars facing Suobachi. And as the Suobachi now, by 12.30, firing, every time they fired, they had to open up their caves to fire, our mortars would fire into them, and we destroyed it and stopped it by one o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon, the first day. All right, Sam, keep on going. What happened next? The first day was over, and we lost so many boys. 19, 20, 21, 22, but remember, so many that they had to call in a reserve. The first day, the second day, the third day, the third Marines. Now, the, the admirals, Admiral uh, Nimitz and, 
Admiral uh, Halsey, uh, and a few others, my mind's not remembering too well, were knew they had to go to, they knew they had to go to Okinawa eventually. So they took the 3rd Marine Division, 18,000 men, and kept them aboard ship in a reserve capacity. Maybe they didn't think they'll need them. It's a cakewalk. They told us there's nobody uh, uh, alive there. What they didn't tell us, there's nobody dead. They're all alive. After two days, they had to call the 3rd Division in. So the landing consisted of the 5th Marine Division on the left, the 4th Marine Division on the right, and then we went like this here and opened up, and the 3rd Division came in between. So as we turned around the island, to start going down the island, is the 5th Division on the left, 3rd Division in the middle, and the 4th Division on the right, and that's how we landed. That means three marine divisions at 18 and 20,000 men at each. That's over 60,000 men coming ashore. You were walking hand in hand with my people. There is no place to be alone, believe me. Now, Sam, earlier you mentioned that you were a machine gunner guarding the stevedores. What else did you bring with you on the island? <laughs> and, you know, you're talking about a 20-year-old, 18 when he joined, and the capacity and the mentality of an individual, I have to admit. And that shows that the American boys weren't trained to kill and mutilate and kill and mutilate. We were learned to have fun. We learned to have dates with girls, not murder them. We learned to enjoy life. You ask, what did we bring with us, huh? What was your uniform? What kind of equipment? We brought everything we need to sustain us. Mm -hmm. But there is no drinking water on the island. Absolutely none. So we were told, when you boys, they talk right plain English, when you boys get there and somebody gets killed or wounded, your buddy, you take his water, not, not if he's wounded, take his water and take his ammunition and take his food, definitely for two reasons. One reason, keep it, the Japs from getting it, because they'll come out and try to strip you, the, the dead boys, and also, you need it. The only thing you can carry is a limitation. Now, they gave us about two quarts of water in canteens, water. The island had no water, so that means I had to take away from a dead marine water because for my own sake. The water was finally, within a couple of hours of our landing, brought in to containers about the size of that over there. Mm -hmm. uh, one third a water tank, like one third of a water tank, and they put them all up and down the beach. Any Marine could come up to them and take all the water he wants, but it was guarded by Marines to make sure no Japs got a drinking water. And uh, food, well, uh, maybe you'd like to be interested in knowing, like I mentioned, we were young kids, and we don't think about dying or getting killed. Or we, did, we learned fast. But back in Hawaii, it was, I was called a porgy bait marine. A porgy bait marine, porgy bait, is one in Navy terms mean you don't drink liquor and you don't smoke. You eat candy. So I'm a candy eater. And the Red Cross provided us with cigarettes and candy. I used to trade my cigarettes for other guys and take their candy. But that's the mentality and the desires of an 18-year-old, 19 and 20. 
American boys. We're not trained killers. So consequently, uh, I knew that uh, uh, I told my mother and father to send me Tootsie Rolls. Why Tootsie Rolls? Because it would melt. Now, Tootsie Roll in those days was as big as your finger, and they cost one penny. As big as your finger, and they cost one penny. And my mother and father sent me boxes of Tootsie Rolls, and I, they arrived while I was in the Hilo. I took the Tootsie Rolls, and I put them in my cartridge belt against all authorizations. Cartridge belt, which carries bullets so that I'd have Tootsie Rolls when I go into battle. I mean, that's important. The fact that I'm getting a shot, that's not important. But I had to have Tootsie Rolls. So instead of having the bullets, I got bandoliers. The bandoliers look, if you remember movies of Pancho Villa, yes. when the bandits across your chest, I got six bandoliers, which are about uh, 300 uh, bullets in, in, in the cartridges. And in, in my cartridge belt, I had the Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> But that's what an 18-year-old to a 19-year-old thinks about, not knowing what war is until you're in it. And then you learn fast. Now, you mentioned the days. What were the nights like? Pardon me? The nights. The nights? While you were The nights were unbelievably quiet because we were told, do not, under any conditions, even if you want to save a life, Leave your foxhole. In other words, no movement whatsoever, unless it's authorized by an officer, so that you know anything moving is the enemy. And I fired. I didn't ask you if you're an American or not. You should not be out of your foxhole. But if a boy was wounded and screaming, and there's plenty of that going on, that was up to the corpsmen, which were Navy, uh, doctors like uh, servicing everybody, hundreds and hundreds of them. Corpsmen would, would go out, they'd crawl out, they knew what to do and how to do, and, uh, and they had passwords. And uh, I stayed right where my gun, uh, I was never allowed to leave the gun, period. Uh, there was three of us on the gun and the machine gun when you land. There was only two of us when we left the beach. One boy, Bob McKay, was in the Fox Hill next to me, one of my buddies. He was hit in both legs doing the barrage to shrapnel life. I went and jumped in this hole and put morphine in, into him as much as I could, but I had to leave him on the beach. I never saw Bob again. I thought he was dead. I ran into him. We got together 50 years later. And Arthur Erdman, who was with me on the gun, he and I uh, stayed with the gun. We never got out of the hole. Uh, that was the order. Don't get out of the foxhole. It was very quiet. The only thing you really heard all night long was star bursts. Uh, the Americans would shoot thousands of star bursts, which would light up the whole area like a Christmas tree. Just make sure you could see the area. And don't forget, there's no infrastructure, none, except uh, they had what's called uh, pillboxes made out of concrete, uh, and they stuck above the ground maybe four or five feet, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's all you see. So there's no infrastructure. Okay. So Sam, one of the pivotal moments, in I one of the great moments in Iwo Jima you have on your hat, which is the flag raising. Did you get to see that? Yes, I saw it. I witnessed it. Mm -hmm. It was Friday morning. Naturally, I'm on the beach, and the beach is about 100 yards off the base of Mount Suabachi, and Suabachi is 550 feet high, so I was about 700 feet away from the top of Suabachi. I'm at the base on the beach, and about Nine o'clock that morning, it was by then, by Friday, which is four days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five days, four days, the, it was quite uh, safe, quite safe on the beach. 
and they had to be because the whole infantry cleaned up the whole area only a half a mile wide and the two oceans now uh, the oceans are on both sides of us and they're going up the island so there, there was no real uh, fighting going on on Friday snipers or, or people in, infiltrating so it was quiet and all of a sudden everybody stood out of it the foxholes, everybody stood up. Thousands and thousands of boys stood up and started yelling, the flag is flying on Suabachi. And there you look up to Suabachi, right above us, right there. And there goes the flag. At that point, maybe a thousand, 800 for sure ships were blowing their horns. The flag is on top of Suabachi. That means that the Americans have taken the high ground of, Mount, of Iwo Jima, although it's just the beginning of the battle. All right, the flag has been raised, but you know it's not over. Tell oh, us. Oh yes. Tell us what happened next. Well, then it's just it's just uh, repeating. Uh, uh, you all know what Iwo Jima was like. It was terrible. It's like any war. Terrible, mm -hmm. terrible. You can't imagine how bad it was. And naturally, we have no, we have no facilities. We have nothing. Food, if you, we had what's called C rations and K rations. It's dry. Kraft cheese became millionaires during the war. They must have. So that's all we had was Kraft cheese. It never melted, and you get it. It was pretty uh, decent. It didn't have to be refrigerated, I guess. Kraft cheese, and the word spam was like lobster stew. But that's what all we had was stan, spam. And crack is hard tack. Hard tack. And I mean hard tack, not saltines. Chewing gum. You get four strips of chewing gum. This is a package. It comes in the package, everything. You get toilet paper in the package. No toilet, but toilet paper. And you get four cigarettes. I traded my cigarettes for the chewing gum. <laughs> you know, and that's the only food you had until about March. Don't forget, we landed in February. And so in March, uh, a new development came, and I understand it developed in Natick, I understand right around the Natick, the food uh, manufacturing company for the Army and Navy, and the Navy was here, is here mm -hmm. in Natick. And they made up what's called 10 in one, 10. So there's 10 meals in one box for a guy, or one meal for 10 men. They call it 10 in one. So if you got a box and you're so determined not to share it, you got 10 meals. If you got a box and you're willing to share it, 10 guys can have it. And in there, believe it or not, was canned spaghetti with a meatball the size of your thumb, smaller, <laughs> and preserved somehow, and, uh, and a, a, a lot of other things. Oh, they're coming into, we had some food, and we had stoves. You wouldn't believe it. Now take a hand and hold it like like this here. That's the stove. Only half the size of this. It's three little legs made of tin, pieces of tin. And you open one, two, and three, and it's not any bigger than your, in your hand. And there was a hole in the middle made of tin, metal, and in there was, uh, what do you call it, a pill. Uh, that lights up, but no fire, uh, like a barbecue. You light the pill, and it's heat, plenty of heat to heat, and you stick the can on it, and heat your can. But no, no flame, no flame. Like you get a barbecue, they have these things underneath the barbecue. Like a sterno can. A thermo, yeah. Okay. Okay, what it's made of, I don't know. 
Also, for food on the island, we did have something made by Hershey Company. Now, Hershey made us uh, Hershey bars, not like you ever seen in your lifetime. You've never seen them because they don't have them. The Hershey bar had pieces of Hershey, like a bar of Hershey. But each bar that you broke off was about a half to three quarters of an inch square, had 600 calories in that little square. And we had all, we used to get three to four a day. Had enough for three or four a day. So if I had three of those a day, I got myself 1,800 calories from that little Hershey bar. Now, the Hershey bar, we tried, we were smart kids, you know. We're gonna put it in, in f a drinking water and, and put it over the flame and make chocolate drink. You can't do it. You take the Hershey bar, you cannot devour a Hershey bar. It has to deteriorate in your mouth. You can't chew it, you can't bite it, you can't swallow it, it, it won't melt, period. But eventually, it'll dissolve in your mouth and you get your 600 calories. Sounds worse than chewing tobacco. Pardon me? It sounds worse than chewing tobacco. Oh, God. <laughs> but it, it was good. It, it tastes good. Yeah. yeah. All right. During the time you were on Iwo Jima, did you remain on the beach? I was on the beach, I would say, uh, from February 19th. I didn't get off the beach until about March the 5th. In other words, all that time I was just on the gun, uh, and that was my job. Uh, Ergman, Arthur, who was killed later than, before we left the island, and myself, stayed with the gun, and we had no particular duties because my other friends were unloading the ships. They brought in supplies to, to don't forget that, supplies to feed 20,000, what do you mean 20, 60,000 men. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of water, a lot of food. We had never had a, a cooked meal, but we had plenty 10 and ones coming in. Okay. So Sam, what happened after that? That's where God stepped in on my, in my behalf. About March the 15th, no, later, about March the 18th, around there, around there, I'm guessing now, it was practically over. In other words, we had reached the other end of the island from Suribachi, we cleaned up that end, there was no more Japs in turn, and no more, and we built the cemetery at the base of Suribachi because there was some dirt they found there, in other words, enough to dig uh, graves and everything. Seven thousand graves. And I was on the cemetery every other day. I was allowed to leave my gun uh, several times uh, to be an assistant to a, a Jewish chaplain who was on the cemetery. He'd come ashore to take care of his duties as a chaplain, and I was his assistant during the afternoons of a few days. Anyhow, we mo the company moved to the other end of the island to replace the guys who raised a flag, uh, what they call the infantry, and bring them back to the, to the beach where they could rest. And we took their positions at the opposite end of the island. Now it's about March the 20th, 21st. It's all over. No more fighting. We are very relaxed. We're very casual and so I have taken it easy. And they notify us that on the 25th of March, we're going to leave that island. Everybody from our company will be ready on the 26th in the morning to board ship at that end, end of the island. Well, the 25th is on a Sunday and they brought in, the Air Force brought in all their crews and they brought in the black, all the black soldiers who were running the kitchens and the, and, and the mess halls 
for the Air Force. And they set up tents all over the place, at the end of the island, and tents. It's safe now. There's no, nothing going on there. And they brought in food, which we stole on them, and everything on Sunday. And they said, you've got to go turn in your ammunition, and all men will leave this island in the morning, about 8 o'clock in the morning, be ready to leave the island. And uh, they gave us an extra pair of pants. I had the same pants for 36 days. <laughs> same shirt. Everything. They gave us a come. They didn't fit us, but it's all right. And we're all ready. We, they said you don't have to stay awake. And normally on Iwo, somebody has to stay awake while the boys, other boys on the Fox all sleep. One person has to stay awake. Nobody stayed awake because it's all over. That was Sunday afternoon, late in the afternoon. And there's everybody standing around smoking and, and, and getting stuff from the, from the Air Force and, and drink and oh God, did we have a time. And we fell asleep Sunday afternoon. About four o'clock Monday morning, the sun is not up yet on Evo, but it's getting a little bit light. We heard some hand grenades go off. Who are the damn fools using hand grenades of our men? It's unnecessary. There's no more Japs. This is all with hindsight. This is all I had to remember if I could. In the Japanese, you know what a kamikaze is. A kamikaze is when an aeroplane flies into another, to a ship and they commit murder, they commit uh, uh, themselves to death by bringing their ship, uh, aeroplane into the ship. Well, a bonsai is on land when the Japanese individual is going to die, he's going to die, but before he dies, he's got to take 10 Marines with him. So he'll go where the hell ever he's going to go. So about 4 o'clock, I didn't realize it for a half an hour. I'm in the middle of a banzai. They came out of the ground in my area where the 5th Pioneers were and, and the end of the beach where we're going to load, get aboard ship at 7 o'clock. They came out of the ground like they've been doing all along, about 200. And in that 200 is, I was told, the general of the Japanese army, Kurobachi. He made what's called the last bonsai. They're going to die. Now, if they're not dead when the sun comes up, the Japanese, they take a hand grenade, they put it to their stomach and blow themselves up. That is their big privilege on my part. They blow themselves up. I knew that. I was trained in camouflage. If you stay away from a banzai, stay in your foxhole, try to avoid contact, because when that sun comes up, they'll blow themselves up, if it's a banzai. And they're yelling, banzai. Okay. They came through our area. Erdman, my buddy was killed. He, no, he said to me, he said, Sam, you stay with the gun. I don't know what all this shooting is going on. It's crazy. It is crazy. What are you, we, what, we're going home. He got out of the foxhole only 10 feet from me. The Jap, drunk as hell. He was drunk. They're all drunk, drinking sake. Came swinging the saber, killed Arthur. I fired twice. I had two cartridges in my gun, which I didn't turn in because I was going to bring them home as souvenirs. 18, 20 year old saves of bullets. I was going to bring them home. I fired twice. The Jap fell on top of me, practically on top of me, on the gun. He's dead. I saw. I. All I remember is my buddies, I was in the de depth of a foxhole, I bet you about three feet deep, and had, with the gun. 
and, and these, my buddies, well, I remember they're yelling, Sam, Sam, get the hell out of there. Sam, come on, it's all over, you're going home. I must have passed out, because I don't remember much what happened. All I know is I didn't realize it until they pulled me out and I crawled out. There was that Jap, before he fell on top of me, threw a hand grenade in front of me. It fell over here. That's enough to kill both of us. It never went off. It was a dud. It was sitting right over here on my shoulder. Because when they got me out, they lined up about four Marines and fired it into that to blow it up. And then they took me on board ship. And I went home to Hilo. Picked up, God picked me up, and took me home to heal. <laughs> it's all over. Sam, I know what you've just described is extremely difficult to tell, and I thank you for relating that story. What happened now once you got to Hilo? I got to Hilo. You couldn't feed us enough. Mm -hmm. You couldn't feed us enough steaks, fried chicken, and fried chicken. Those days were fried up in, boy, I'll tell you, fried. Meals and meals. Mm -hmm. And then we start training because they told us we are going to Japan. That's what we were trained for. Not for Iwo Jima, we were trained to go to Japan, but I told you that the President of the United States had to have Iwo before the atomic bomb. He was building the atomic bomb. They had no way of getting that bomb. They only had two. The world didn't know it. Right. We only had two. While you were on Hilo, did you, you, did you hear about the death of FB, FDR, the President? What? Did you hear about the death of President Roosevelt? No. Oh, the death? Yes. He didn't die when I was on Hilo. Oh, uh, he was, uh, okay. No. He died on April the 12th, mm -hmm. 1945. And where were you then? On the 11th, uh -huh. the day before, it's my birthday. Uh huh. And I pulled into Honolulu. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Mm -hmm. I pulled into Honolulu, and there's no sooner put in, you know what they did? They issued black bands the next morning. Everybody had to put on a mm -hmm. black fan. Uh, uh, that morning, Roosevelt died on the 12th. I don't forget that because the day before was my birthday. <laughs> and I pulled a fast one on them. I did another one. The SOB Marine got, did something. A board ship with all thousands of survivors from Iwo Jima. But I'm an individual. I think like a kid, too. I had no clothes except what I took off the island. Uh, I went to my chaplain, Jewish chaplain, who was aboard ship, and I told him that I have relatives on, in Honolulu. Well, let's say they weren't literally right. They're not relatives. They're real, real close friends from New London, Connecticut. And what was he doing there? He was working when war broke out for Doris Duke. You heard of Doris Duke? Mm -hmm. Well, Doris Duke had a big place in, in Honolulu, and he was her chauffeur and bodyguard when the war broke out, and he stayed there, married and had children, and I knew he was there, and I went into the radio shack of the ship, against all regulations, and asked them, if they, are you got a connection to telephone on shore? Yeah. I said, my aunt's here. I lied like hell. And gave him the name, and they, he found them. And he called us, we spoke to him on the phone, and he said, I'll come down to the ship, get liberty if you can. Now, the ship is in Honolulu, we just got back from Iwo. I got liberty, the chaplain got me to be allowed off the ship uh, with my promise and honor to return that ship by 5 o'clock. 
because the ship will pull out about 5.30 to go to back to Hilo. I'm in Honolulu. They get, some Navy guy offered me all his khaki. I got dressed in khaki and went ashore. Went ashore. My birthday was that day, April the 11th. And they got pictures of that. And the, fa and the, the family got together with everybody on the island that, that, uh, from my hometown. And we must have been about 20 of us there to celebrate Sam's 21st birthday. Oh, that must have been great. <laughs> and the next morning, President Roosevelt died mm -hmm. on the 12th of April. Not so great. And back to Hilo we went. All right. So you're training for Japan. Pardon me? You're, you're training to, for the invasion of Japan. Of Japan in Hilo. Now, Only you're... from, uh, we landed in Hilo on uh, about the, uh, three days later. It only took mm -hmm. about two, three days to get there. And that's April, about April the 18th and 19th we landed. And uh, the bomb fell on August the 9th. The first one did, I think, mm -hmm. or the second. And the bomb, we never heard the word atomic. I know nothing about atomic energy at that point, nothing. All we know was atomic bomb f fell. And we immediately boarded ship, mm -hmm. and we're on our way. Now, we were boarded ship to go to, to uh, Japan. But it takes from Hilo, although it's only uh, uh, it's about 2,000 miles, 3,000, oh, more 3,000, mm -hmm. you understand? It took, I think it was about 50 days to get to Japan because you go zigzag. Mm -hmm. And I landed on September 22nd, 1945, in a place called Kusha. Sasebo. Now, Sasebo, Japan, is where we were going to land had the war not ended. Also, Sasebo is 25 miles from Nagasaki. Oh, boy. Now, the atomic bomb fell in Nagasaki on the 9th of August. On the 22nd, 23rd, give or take that day, they, we landed. I vol didn't volunteer, they just said, you're going into Nagasaki, which was about 25 miles from where we're going to be bivouacked, a place called Sasebo. And they drove us by truck. Now, before we went into Nagasaki to see what's happening with Tommy Bond, nobody knew what had happened. They stripped me naked, and they stripped put me a, a, a big belt around my waist with, with film, a film from a camera, film, about 10 rolls of film in my, and they just said, wear this here, when you come back, you will not be allowed off the trucks until doctors examine you for radiation. I went into Hilo, uh, to Nagasaki for only three hours to strip anything or people there. And when they got back into camp, back uh, to Sasebo, that evening, afternoon, they, uh, I got undressed and they took out the film and held it up. If the film had showed development, that meant I had radiation. Luckily, it didn't. <laughs> but I got cancer anyway. Oh, dear. Yeah. just. Uh, in the last 10 years. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that's my time in Sasebo. Now, being from the draft, actually, after my serial number, there's SS. My serial number was 801972SS. SS stands for Social Se uh, Selective Service. And that means the law, Mr. Roosevelt made him, bless him. <laughs> he said, any boys who will be taken in the selective service through the draft must stay in the service no matter how long it lasts, one year, a hundred years, until the war is over. 
other people had uh, like four years or five years terms. We had what's called a permanent term until the war is over. He had to have the selective service. He declared the war over while I'm in Japan. The war is over. I'm a civilian. But where am I? I'm in Japan. I ran down. I don't have to have no more duty. Don't call me. Don't you tell me I'm, no, I'm a civilian. I ran down to the docks. It's like going uh, to uh, Cape Cod and, and sitting at the docks there because the first ship comes from America. I'm going to sneak aboard if I have to. I'm going home. And you can't arrest me. I'm a civilian. I took about three ships. And finally, I found one ship that's unloading, and they're going to leave in the next morning. And I told the off commanding officer, and he gave me permission. I left, and I <laughs> ran on that ship. And I volunteered immediately for the mess kitchen. Mess, and only a damn fool met volunteers aboard ship for the mess hall. You know why? Because we crossed the international date line almost to the, the equator. It's so hot up there you can't breathe. So I got the mess hall and I got, uh, became a god on the refrigerator. So when they open the refrigerator for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I, somebody has to be there and make sure nobody takes the food out. And I'm a god, a marine god, in the Navy ship, all I had to do was sit there and eat eggs and eat ice cream because I'm in a, a, a refrigerator that's 40 degrees or 38 degrees and everybody else is up topside on the ship dying of the heat. <laughs> Come back to, to San Diego. There is something coming back to San Diego. You know what a flatbed is on, uh, on a ship? Uh, 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 these barges that take garbage out to sea, all it is is a big, big flat barge, big one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Two of them came out of, the, of San Diego to greet us. Um, what do you think, you'll never guess, that's on those barges. Several hundred teenage girls, 17, 18, 19, and 20, all dancing and, and uh, going crazy on these barges. And these Marines, you, you practically had to tie them down. They're on the big troop ship, and these barges come by, and all these teenage girls are, are greeting us. When we landed that afternoon in San Diego, we all had dysentery, I guess it's dysentery, or, or the runs, because when we get, ran off the ship, on the docks, they had gallons, not a gallon, gallons of ice cream, milk, eggs. And we didn't eat the ice cream. We just took it and dumped it on our heads, on your head. I, uh, milk we threw in each other's face. I got sick a good couple hours later. I was very sick. Then they lined up the docks in, in San Diego. In those days, don't forget, this is 1945. Uh, they lined up the docks, 46, I'm sorry, uh, with telephones. And telephones in those days, you had to go through an operator to use it a long distance. And every Marine was issued a number, uh, hundreds of numbers. And when your number's called, you were allowed to go to the, the young girls were lined up, maybe a hundred of them with telephones, not cell phones, telephones. And you're allowed one telephone call to any place in the United States. And she'll get that number for you and call your number. And you can talk for about three or four minutes. And I talked to my mother the first time, <laughs> two years. Go home. Oh, that must have been a very special moment for you, Sam. Mommy? It uh, must have been a very special moment calling your mom. It's so special that two boys broke their legs getting off the ship because they were married and their wives were on the deck, on the docks. They couldn't wait to get off the gangplank. They jumped. Oh, no. 
All right, so you're back in San Diego. Tell us what happened next. That's another story. I've got more stories. All right, now I'm 21 years old. I know that because I'm selective service, they had no right to put me, uh, take me for duty because I'm going home to be properly discharged. Well, anybody who got taken in in Springfield, Massachusetts, does not go back to Massachusetts to get a discharge. You go what they call the closest point to enlistment. The closest point to enlistment was Bainbridge, Maryland. That's where the Marines would be discharged, you know, properly discharged. So they're going to send me to Bainbridge, Maryland by train. Now, that's a five-day trip on the Santa Fe to Bainbridge, Maryland. And if you think that after living through Iwo and everything, that I'm going to go on a trip trip home, I'd rather walk home. I want out of the Marines. I want out now. Can't do it. So I went to the Red Cross because I heard, I heard that the Red Cross could step in and get your discharge in California, right where you are, mm -hmm. if you can show reason. Two of the reasons was you found a girl, you were getting married there. That is good enough reason. And the other reason was you had a job offer to you and you, you want to live in California. Under those conditions, they'll just discharge you in California. I had a family who knew me there and everything, and uh, they signed papers that I'm going to get married to a girl, their daughter, and they had a job offer. Under those conditions, I presented it to my commanding officer, and he allowed me to be discharged in Camp Pendleton, California. Well, I didn't know. It, the day of discharge, I went into the big, big room of people being discharged, and the first desk I came up to, there was a line of desks, they asked me, where do you come from? Here's your discharge. Where do you come from? I said, New London, Connecticut. Uh, pay the man $150, five cents a mile to wherever you live in the United States. Travel expense. At 3,000 miles, it's $150. You see, keep walking. Next guy, where do you come from? New London, Connecticut. Give my ticket on the Santa Fe. They have to give you transportation wherever you go in the United States. The next guy, where do you come from? New London, what state? Connecticut. Connecticut is given $300 bonuses. Give him $100 is enough to last him until he gets home to Connecticut. Bonuses. I'm walking away with over $300 and the ticket to go home. So I stayed a month in California to say thank you to this family that befriended me. And then I went home a civilian. Went home a civilian. Now this I gotta tell you. I called my mother from San Diego, from Los Angeles to tell her I'm alive and I'm well, I'm coming home. I was going with this girl for almost two years, a year and a half. People introduced me, and, and the family took me in on weekends. I used to spend at their house in Los Angeles. That's beside the point. But it, I was very much attached to the family. When I got on the train, I told my mother, I'll be four days. I'll, I'll call you from Chicago, Ma, when I get in, and then I'll call you. And four days later, on Friday afternoon, I pulled into Chicago. I got on the telephone before you even washed up. And I called my mother again in New London. And those of you only got three minutes with the goddamn operator, she'll hang up on you. And, and I'm yelling, Mom, I'm home, I'm home, I'm in Chicago. I'll be, have the, everybody at the station, at the railroad station. That's another thing, a fallacy of mine. I remember movies when guys came up from the service. They had bands and they had marching parades. And I'm still, although 21, I, re I came back to 17 and 18 when I left. A mentality, I'm home. I'm going to get a parade. I'm alive. Marine. 
I get on the train. I told my mother, I have everybody at the station. At 9 o'clock, the, the train will be in. We pulled into New London on time. I got off the train. I'm home. And I went outside. You can throw a bowling ball down the station, and you'll hit nobody. No mother, no father, nobody to greet me. As I'm standing there, the police came up. You Sam Bernstein? Yes. Get in the squad car right away. I said, what's the matter? We'll take you to your mother and father. Where the hell are they? They're in Jewish temple. Why? My mother would not greet me on a common station platform. She's waiting for me in a Jewish temple. Now, do you know what a bar mitzvah is? Definitely, okay. yep. It happened that morning there was a bar mitzvah at the temple. The boy. Well, I came there, they stopped the whole uh, bar mitzvah, and they rushed me in, and they took me to an ante a back room where my mother and father got up and came in there with a few other relatives, and the rabbi there uh, proceeded, and before you know, it's all over. When the service was over, we're in the back room going crazy, yelling and everything, this woman came in whose son was being bar mitzvahed, Mrs. Levine. She comes in the back room, and she's friends with my mother and father, and, and she knew me when I was a little, little boy. And she says to my mother, I remember, boy, Rose, you'll bring Sammy to the party tomorrow. That means they had a big celebration at the hotel, and they, she said, he's invited. Bring him. I said, Mrs. Levine, I'm not going to no celebration. I just got home. I have no clothes, and I, I only have uniform, and besides, uh, I'm tired. She said, you'll come, you'll sit with my niece. I said, how old is your niece? She's 17. I said, Mrs. Levine, I just came back from Japan at Iwo Jima. I ain't sit with no damn 17-year-old. Which one is your niece? And she opened the door, and she pointed to some girls sitting in the temple. The one with the long hair near the window. I married that girl. Mazel tov. Wow. When you were discharged, what was your rank? What is that? What was your rank when you were discharged? Corporal. You were... And what did you do after the war? You're back home. Tried my damnest to get into school. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't believe it. There's quotas. Every damn school had a quota. 10% Jews and 10% from the state. And I wasn't smart enough to be in the 10% higher bracket. Mm -hmm. So... I had some uh, relatives who had a, an uncle. His name was General Sarnoff. General Sarnoff was the president of RCA at that time. Sarnoff. He was the president of RCA. They called uh, Sarnoff on the phone and told him the story that I couldn't get into college or anything like that. and. Uh, he said he's got a class going in. Uh, RCA had a, a school, radio school. Would he like to go to radio school? And I'll take anything in school. So they sent me to school the government paid for on the corner of Canal and Barrack in New York. Canal and Barrack, mm -hmm. entrance to the Holland Tunnel. And that's where I went to school, uh, RCA. I graduated, took a two-year course, and I did it in one year because I stayed on for vacations and, 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 and summer vacation. I didn't take it. I, I want to finish as fast as I can. And I graduated from RCA as a radio uh, technician and a radio man. But, uh, and I got a job at uh, a place in New line called Temple Tone Radio. Manufacturing. Manufacturing. In those days, uh, uh, little radios, uh, little uh, portables and everything. Uh, and that lasted uh, about six months, seven months, when I decided that's not uh, a, a profession for me. And uh, I met Roberta at the Bar Mitzvah, and I called her several times, and. And uh, her aunts and relatives are all living in New London, Connecticut, and she's there to visit. 
and God helped me. She went to college for the first year. Where did she go? College, Connecticut State for Women, New London, Connecticut. <laughs> My home, New London, Connecticut. That made the kitsch, and there it is. Got engaged but my father-in-law wouldn't let us get married until her 20th birthday, which was all right. And uh, two weeks before her 20th birthday, we got married. Now, Sam, you uh, decided not to be a radio technician. Yeah. What did you end up doing? Um, some people asked me if I, uh, they needed some work done in their house. Could I make some corners, you know, out of wood, cornices over the window? And I said, yes. They said, they'll pay me if I can do it. You know, well, I took work any place I can get it, and I made them. Then they told somebody else, and, and this one told that one. And before you know it, I was hanging a Venetian blind for a business uh, called a Marvel Shop in New London, Connecticut. And then we decided we're getting married. Uh, I'm going to go on my own. And I had the nerve to to uh, try things on my own. So I went to Kirsch Company. Kirsch is, in those days was still sitting out. The Travis Rods came into being in 1946. Travis Rods, you know, in your house, mm -hmm. you pull the cord and the drapes move? Mm -hmm. Travis Rods. And I became an installer, hanging Travis Rods, hanging blinds from, for myself. And before you know it, I got a store selling blinds and selling Travis rods. And that lasted uh, until 1960. At that time, I was married, mm -hmm. three children. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not working out the, the business because in, if, if you remember, in 1959, they weren't even born. 1959 was the first tri shopping centers in Connecticut, in New London, anyway, that day. And uh, my business was no good because you had to open a business in the shopping center and I couldn't afford to go in business. So I put my trade in a trade journal, my uh, uh, expertise, what I could do. And uh, two people answered, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Boston, Massachusetts, answered me. And one of me for a manager of a drapery business. Well, my wife comes from Boston. So we moved to Boston, and I got a job in Boston. That lasted about 10 years, and then I opened my own factory, which I still own. Well, my son runs it now, in the Hyde Park. And what is the, uh, the company called? Sam's Drapery Manu... I'm sorry, Sam's and Son. Sam's and Son. Drapery Manufacturing in Reedville, Mass. Okay. Now, you mentioned you um, took advantage of the GI Bill. Did you join any organizations after the war, like the VFW? Only the Jewish war veterans. Mm -hmm. You can't belong to every veterans organization. They're all out there. They're all wonderful. It's just like uh, 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 contri contributing. You don't tell me. You can't contribute to everybody. So I picked the Jewish war veterans. I was associated with the temple. I still am. And, uh, and my friends were all there. And so uh, that stayed with the Jewish war veterans. And uh, I'm a Mason. I'm a 30 degree Mason, 32 degree Mason. I joined the Masons. And uh, after all, uh, uh, they're expensive to belong to these organizations. Now, you mentioned that you were one of five sons. Did right. your four brothers make it out okay? All five of us came home. Mm -hmm. But one, the oldest one, Saul, he led this, not the story, he led the, uh, a, a banzai, I'm sorry, he attacked the village in Buna, New Guinea, in New Guinea, Buna, Mich Buna Mission, New Guinea, on January the 1st, 1943. That's why I joined the Marines right then and there. He uh, attacked them. So he has uh, a company, and, and he attacked and wiped out the garrison at Buna Mission, New Guinea. And then my brother Harold is in the Coast Guard. 
he got discharged. He never left the country. He was too old at the time. He had two children in, in, 40, in 43. And he lived in North Fork, Virginia, but he was in the Coast Guard. And he got discharged. And then the brother Joe, Joe lived in the California. Joe was one of the big managers in American Airlines. I had a free pass as long as he lived. <laughs> Anyhow, American Airlines took that away when he died. And uh, he, he lived in California. And Ralph uh, lived at home, and uh, he settled in New London with me. All right, we're just getting almost ready to wrap up this interview. Sam, how important was it for you to serve in the military? To do what? To serve, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Let me tell you that you're talking to somebody with an SOB Marine. I don't like the way that things are going today. You ask me, I say enemies of America, the United States, kill, kill. Why? Education doesn't work. Sitting around a round table does not work. You don't remember, but when the Vietnam War was winding down, they couldn't decide at the last day, last minute, what shape the goddamn table's gonna be in, in, in the, wherever they were trying to sign the, the treaty with, Japan, with uh, North Korea or Vietnam, no, with, I'm sorry, the Korean War, mm -hmm. Korean War. And so they took uh, two or three days to decide the shape of the table. In the meantime, two and three days, we lost American servicemen, some more. I'm not from that generation. I want to kill the enemy and go home and live. There's only three things in my life worth living for, worthwhile. Number one, not my family and my wife. Number one is my country. If I got a country, then I can have a wife and children. And if I have a wife and children, then I can have a religion. And there's the three things that I live. And under that condition, my country comes first. And remember, when they have a draft, they don't ask you, would you like to go? They don't ask you, can you go? You go, or you leave the country. And you ask me about my country, the country comes first. Well, Sam Bernstein, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you. Thank you.